Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Victor Rosario. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, I'm getting frequent nausea and vomiting, with an aspiration pneumonia and abdominal discomfort. I had an endoscopy which revealed a small ulcer after dropping my hematocrit. Now, I feel anemic. I had a CT scan last week that showed pneumatosis and my cecum worrisome for ischemic colitis, bilateral hydronephrosis and multiple liver lesions. Yesterday, I had multiple bowel movements and passing flatus, and had epigastric pain. Okay, what's your age? Sixty-seven, Doctor. Do you smoke or drink? I have a chronic alcohol use, but I've stopped smoking long back. Tell me your past medical history. I have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, history of pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia, osteoporosis, alcoholism, microcytic anemia. Well... Your physical examination shows you are a febrile. Your heart rate is in the hundreds to 120s at times with atrial fibrillation. Respiratory rate is 17 to 20. Blood pressure 130s to 150s and 60s to 70s. Your abdomen is distended with tenderness mainly in the upper abdomen but very difficult to localize. The CT scan shows pneumatosis in the cecum with an enlarged cecum filled with stool and air fluid levels with chronically dilated small bowel. There is a possibility of ischemic cecum with possible metastatic disease, bilateral hydronephrosis on atrial fibrillation, aspiration pneumonia, chronic alcohol abuse, acute renal failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, anemia with gastric ulcer. I would recommend getting a repeat CT scan to assess it further to see if there's worsening pneumatosis versus resolution to further evaluate the liver lesions and make decisions regarding planning at that time. Since you have frequent desaturations secondary to your aspiration pneumonia and any surgical procedure or any surgical intervention would certainly require intubation that would then necessitate long-term ventilator care. So I will look at your CT scan and make decisions based on the findings.
Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Noah Baxter. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have intolerance to allergies, inhalant and environmental allergies. Okay, do you get any kind of reactions like an itchy rash, throat or tongue swelling, shortness of breath, vomiting, lightheadedness, and low blood pressure? Clinically, these symptoms show the presence of anaphylaxis. No, doctor. Or else, do you get itchy red welts called angioedema that develop on your skin? No, doctor. Are you taking any medication for allergies? No, doctor. May I know your past medical history? Uh, six months back, when I was under dialysis due to renal failure, I had an acute event of perioral swelling, uh, etiology uncertain. The diagnosis results showed that the allergic reaction was due to Keflax that was used to treat a cellulitis dialysis shunt infection. What medications are you taking now? I am taking a Tanolol for controlling my blood pressure, sodium bicarbonate, Lovatsa, and Dialovite. I didn't have any other issues upon my treatment and discharge that included corticosteroid therapy and antihistamine therapy and monitoring. What were the surgeries performed? Perm cath insertion three times in peritoneal dialysis. Are you allergic to any medications? Yes, heparin causes thromocytopenia. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. May I know your family history of diseases? My family members have severe heart disease, carcinoma, and food allergies. Well, your test report shows your blood pressure is 128.78, pulse 70, temperature is 97.8, weight is 207 pounds, and height is 5 feet 7 inches. I suspect you have developed acute anaphylaxis. I would suggest you to go for a radioallergosorbin test, a blood test using radioimmunoassay test to investigate specific IgE antibodies to determine the substances the subject is allergic to. I shall recommend further treatment and medications upon the test results. If the test report shows any specific food or inhalant allergen that is found to be quite high on the sensitivity scale, I would likely recommend that you avoid the offending agent. Right now, I would recommend you to stop further usage of cephalosporin antibiotics, which may be the cause of your allergic reaction, and I would consider your case as an allergy. Being on atinolol, it would be very difficult to treat acute anaphylaxis. I am prescribing an EpiPen in the event of acute angioedema or allergic reaction or sensation of impeding allergic reaction, and you have to proceed directly to the emergency room for further evaluation and treatment recommendations after the administration of an EpiPen. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. 
You hear a doctor briefing his colleague about a patient. Now read the question. Have you got a list of all the patients and locations? Yeah. Who is our sickest patient? Mr. Marcel is the sickest patient. He is a 36-year-old male with a ruptured appendix awaiting OR. He became sick over the last 48 hours with worsening abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. We gave him fluids and brought antibiotics. Which antibiotics and how much fluid? Piptazo with 2 liters of normal saline so far. Imaging showed a ruptured appendix with free air under the diaphragm. I would keep a close eye on him. Have you drawn blood cultures? Yes. But they were drawn about an hour after antibiotics were started. And what are the plans if there is a delay in surgery? I haven't spoken to ICU yet, but he might need to go there if his condition worsens while he is waiting for the OR. Sound good? Yeah. I'll speak to ICU as soon as we're done here. Question 26. You hear part of a surgical team's briefing. Now read the question. She currently only has intermittent late decelerations, and these have improved with her position changes and supplemental oxygen. We'll monitor her until she's fully dilated and allow her to push. If there's any evidence of fetal distress or persistent late decelerations, we should be prepared to go to C-section. I've alerted the ought to be prepared in case we need to use them. Great, I'll discuss this plan with Mrs. Aldrich, and we are done here. What are her vitals right now? Normal. I just checked 15 minutes ago. She had no late decelerations since you were called. Let's continue to monitor her. I need to know when she's complete and pushing so we can keep a close eye on her second stage. Question 27. You hear a radiologist talking about a new initiative that has been introduced. Now read the question. This is a big, ambitious project. We're going to focus on patient flow through the system right from the very start. When a patient sees their commission and they require support from radiology with imaging and they make a request. We want to get that request from imaging as quickly and as efficiently through the system to the reports available to the commission, so they can make the appropriate management plan and take the patient's clinical journey forwards. This is an ideal opportunity now to really embed some forward behavior, where we're learning together, we're developing together, we're looking at creating where we have today's work completed today that there's no delay so we're really improving the services to our patients. We are all taking control, we are all involved and we will be proactive and not reactive, so we have analyzed CT and MRI services. We have outlined and prioritized areas for further improvement, and you can make a difference. Question 28. You hear a pharmacist talking to a doctor regarding a patient's medication. Now read the question. Hi.
Hi, Dr. Marcy, is this a good time? I need two minutes to discuss about Mrs. Samuel. I'm Harper and I'm providing pharmacy coverage to the unit. I have a few minutes. What's up? Nursing raised a concern from rounds this morning. The situation is that Mrs. Samuel's pain isn't being well controlled. She's sedated, which is having an impact on her participation in therapies and she's continually reporting her pain at 8 out of 10. Okay. What's the background of the patient? She has fallen three times since her admission to rehab and she's requesting to go home at her first pass this weekend, some big family anniversary. But my assessment is that we are not adequately controlling her pain and what we're giving her is contributing to these falls. Okay, so what do you recommend? Well, after reviewing her chart, I'm considering lowering her dose of opiates and introducing an anti-inflammatory which would be less sedating and she should be able to tolerate. Yeah, that makes sense. Her husband is coming in this Tuesday at 9 a.m. If you're available, we could meet to discuss. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Let's meet back here and we'll talk to the family together. Now look at question 29. You hear an optometrist talking to a patient. Now read the question. Mrs. Wilfred, what brings you here today? I am having trouble with my vision. I can't see and I need new contacts. Okay, are you having trouble seeing up close or far away? I can't see anything. I'm night blind and my eye is very itchy now. I brought my glasses with me and I want you to check them. Okay, let me check your glasses. I will show you some lenses and just tell me if one of these lenses makes these letters look better. These aren't working. Okay. Now I'm going to check the health of your eyes. It looks like you have a detached retina and contacts will not help in this situation. You need a surgery. Can I get glasses instead? No mom, the problem that you are having now will not improve by using glasses. Can you give me some drops for a few months? No mom, drops will not help with your detached retina. Question 30 you hear a podiatrist talking about a proposal to offer help with dialysis patients' foot care. Now read the question. For the last couple of years, we were aware that a lot of the patients who underwent dialysis were at really high risk of developing complications with their feet, especially the diabetic patients. We found that a lot of them were struggling to attend our clinics and access the service. We had to come up with an ingenuity project to try and improve an element of care, and we thought this was a brilliant opportunity to look at the problem that we already identified and see if we could come up with a solution for it. So, we are offering our service to the people who would find it difficult to access our service. It would be really nice as we're making a difference to their life because they don't have to go out on their day off, and they go out three mornings a week, and when it's freezing cold. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. 
Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic white blood cell disorders. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. White blood cells are predominantly involved in fighting infections and participating in inflammatory reactions, while red blood cells carry oxygen to the body. Platelets help stop bleeding. The normal number of white blood cell ranges from around 4 to 11 billion cells per liter. Newborn babies have a higher range, from around 9 to 30 billion cells per liter, which goes down over the first two years of life and is similar to adult normal ranges for the rest of childhood. Opposed to red blood cells, the normal range is not affected by gender. However, it is affected by race. In national studies, African Americans have lower baseline white blood cell counts than Caucasians. There are several different ways to categorize white blood cell disorders. First, they can be categorized by cause, those that affect white blood cell production and other factors that affect the function of the white blood cell. Secondly, white blood cell disorders might be categorized by which type of white blood cell is affected. In some disorders, all the white blood cells are affected, but others only affect one type. There are five major types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, which predominantly fight bacterial infections. Lymphocytes, which predominantly fight viral infections. Monocytes, which predominantly fight fungal infections. Eosinophils, which predominantly fight parasitic infections and are involved in allergic reactions. And basophils, which are involved in inflammatory reactions. Thirdly, white blood cell disorders can be classified as benign or malignant. The majority of white blood cell disorders are benign. Generally, too much of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with philia on the end of the word, and too few of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with penia, which is applicable to all types of white blood cells. For instance, leukophilia is a white blood cell count above the normal range, and leukopenia is a white blood cell count below the normal range. These can also be applied scientific white blood cells, such as neutropenia, with too few neutrophils, or basophilia, with too many basophils. Leukophilia is an increased number of white blood cells. The most common causes are infection, medications like prednisone. Autoimmune neutropenia occurs when the body secretes antibodies that attack and destroy neutrophils. Patients with severe congenital neutropenia are born with severe neutropenia secondary to genetic mutation and have recurrent bacterial infections. Cyclic neutropenia is caused due to genetic mutation similar to severe congenital neutropenia. However, the neutropenia does not occur every day but in cycles of about 21 days. Leukemia is a cancerous white blood cells produced in the bone marrow. Chronic granulomatous disease is a disorder where multiple types of white blood cells become unable to function properly. It is an inherited condition and results in multiple infections, particularly pneumonia and abscesses. Leukocyte adhesion deficiency is a disorder where the white blood cells are unable to move areas of infection.
Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with a neurosurgeon called Dr. Ian Marsh, who specializes in the treatment of concussion in sport. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. My guest today is Dr. Ian Marsh, a specialist in the treatment of concussion in sport and a co-author on a new set of guidelines. So, Dr. Marsh, what's the aim of these new guidelines? Well, the aim was really to provide a resource, um, not for the top-level professional sports people, but for parents, teachers and coaches of young people playing sport. Mm -hmm. The guidelines basically offer some expert information from a GP an emergency physician and myself as a neurosurgeon about what the condition is, also how to identify the symptoms and how to manage it. If any of your listeners have ever had a concussion doing sports, you'll know how frightening it can be. It's confusing and um, painful and difficult sometimes for teachers, parents or whoever to work out if someone with concussion is okay. I mean, we hope to remedy that. Mm -hmm. And how do we know when someone is suffering from concussion? Well, obviously, if the person's actually knocked out, it's clear. Mm -hmm. But not all patients actually lose consciousness. Often, following a hard knock to the head, they become disorientated or experience headaches, nausea or vomiting. Um, these are signs of concussion, and they may clear initially, but then return when the individual actually undertakes further physical activity, right. when they start to train, say. So it can actually take quite a while for things to really clear up. The essence of it is that people shouldn't start playing again until those warning signs have completely subsided. Yes, and you say that waiting anything less than 14 days after all the symptoms have cleared would be too early to return. Yeah, that's right. If they go back too early, they risk a second concussion. And as we know from professional athletes, they may have to give up their sport if they have too many concussions. Right. So it's better, particularly in a young person with a developing brain, to allow all of the symptoms to settle and only then return to play. Mm. Well usually return to train first, then return to play after that. It used to be thought that receiving another concussion could lead to severe brain swelling, and that could be fatal, or at least involve a visit to the emergency room. I think the evidence is fairly slim for that. What we do know, though, is that the compounding effect of having one concussion followed by another seems to be more severe than just the one. So it's always better to let the brain recover fully before playing again. Right, so who's at the highest risk of sports concussion? Well, actually a concussion can happen whenever anyone receives a blow to the head. Usually it's a sort of twisting blow, not a straight-on blow. But obviously people playing sports like rugby, where there's bodily contact, stand more chance of being at the receiving end of such a blow. 
But having said that, it's just as likely to affect kids kicking a ball around a park as it is to affect top professional players in big matches.、Mm. Do you think that youth sports need specialist concussion doctors on hand, like the professionals do? There's always a risk, and we know that it happens from time to time. But I mean, most games, even the most dangerous ones, are without incident at all. I think people who are involved in running youth sports, whether they be referees, coaches, or parents, can be made aware of how to manage concussion, the signs that they need to look out for. And maybe the warnings of something more serious, so that they can take the appropriate actions.、Mm. But I think always having a doctor on the sidelines where young people are playing is just an overreaction. Right. In the USA, college football is big business. They're trialling helmet sensors and impact sensors. Do you think that's something we need everywhere? Well, I don't think it'll come to that. I think there are two scenarios here. The first is one where a concussion's a one-off event following a significant blow to the head. Right. The second's quite different and involves chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This comes about particularly in American football, where players use their helmets and heads almost like weapons. That type of repeated impact seems to add up over the player's career. That's something we've heard being discussed, mostly in the USA. Naturally, there's interest generally in protecting players, particularly in the professional levels of sport. But I see that as a different matter to the management of concussion itself.